it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jeff Allman. Uh, Jeff is a, a, the Stanford Asherman uh, Professor Emeritus of uh, Engineering in the, in the Computer Science Department at Stanford University, which is where I met Jeff uh, during my PhD. And he played a very unique role in my own education by uh, supervising half of my PhD thesis and uh, essentially teaching me how to do uh, theoretical research in databases. Uh, Jeff has been at Stanford since 1979. He was the chair of the department uh, from 1990 to 1994. Uh, prior to Stanford, he was a professor at Princeton University and before that a researcher at uh, Bell Labs. Uh, he has a PhD uh, from Princeton and an undergraduate degree from Columbia University. Um, now, uh, before moving on, I want to say that it's, it's not very easy to introduce Jeff Allman because uh, I mean, his career uh, represents, in my mind, a dream career of an academic in uh, computer science with impressive academic positions that he held, um, impressive level of contributions to many fields of computer science, which have been recognized by an impressive number of awards and honors. So, in this limited time that I have, of course, I can only mention several of these, but maybe one comment uh, that I think that's worth making to summarize this dream career is to say that Jeff is uh, one of the most prolific computer scientists uh, in the history of this discipline. Uh, perhaps uh, one of his most important contributions to computer science is as an educator, an unmatched educator of computer scientists. He's authored or co-authored 16 textbooks in many fields of computer science, including databases, uh, automata theory, compilers, data structures, algorithms, data mining, functional programming, all standards in these fields, which are being read, uh, have been read, and are being read by so many computer scientists across the world to learn these subjects, and I'm sure that includes many of us, many of us here. Um, so. As reflected by the wide range of topics of his books, he's made uh, significant research contributions to these fields of computer science as well, which have been recognized by many prestigious awards. I'll list some of these. Uh, he's both in the Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Academy of Engineering. Uh, he was the co-recipient of the 2010 IEEE von Neumann Medal very prestigious award by IEEE, uh, recognizing contributions across all fields of computer science. And I quote, for laying the foundations for the fields of automata and language theory, and many seminal contributions to theoretical computer science. Uh, he was given the Knut Prize, prestigious award in theoretical computer science. And I quote again, for his sustained research contributions to theoretical computer science, as it, especially as it relates to applied areas of computer science, such as compilers, parallelism, and databases. Um, I won't quote more, but just to look a few more of his uh, many awards. He's been given the Sigmod Contributions Award and Sigmod Edgar Code Innovations Award, recognizing his contributions to databases, and the ACM's Carl Carl Strom Outstanding Educator Award, recognizing his contributions as an educator of uh, computer science. And finally, uh, as a PhD advisor, he has advised many successful uh, students uh, who became very successful computer scientists. Within databases, I can name just a few. Uh, Surajit Chaudhary from MSR, um, uh, Mihalis Yanakakis from Columbia University, the late Alberto Mendelssohn from University of Toronto, and of course, uh, entrepreneurs like Sergey Brin, the co-founder founder of Google. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to thank Jeff for being with us here and leave the floor to him and he'll tell us what he thinks data science is and uh, how he thinks we should educate data scientists. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, so, I mean, thank, thank, thank you very much. None of that is, of course, true, but uh, anyway, uh, in fact, um, I, um, I wanted to give a technical talk on the work that I had been doing um, on, on MapReduce algorithms, but Semi told me that that was his recruiting talk here, so I had to find something else. Uh, and so I've, I've been, uh, what I'm giving, this is probably the first time in my life I've given what is primarily a political talk rather than a technical talk, although I will uh, cap it off by talking a little bit, try to teach you a few algorithms that I have found uh, very important in data science. Uh, and 
Uh, just just to, to sort of uh, to introduce, um, uh, there are people who say that data science is actually just machine learning. There are people who say it's just statistics. Uh, I disagree, and I'm going to try to outline uh, why. And then uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is informed by an experience I've had. I'll tell you about later in what's called the Data Science Education Roundtable. Uh, that that sort of flavor uh, sort of flavors the whole story, uh, and then as I said, I'll, I'll just talk about a few algorithms uh, that I think uh, every data scientist ought to know about, and that illustrate my points about it not being machine learning and not being uh, statistics. Okay, so if you have, uh, anyway, the the idea has been around longer than you might think. Again, two thousand, the big hype idea was data mining. Uh, and then around 2010, people discovered big data. Okay, same thing. Uh, and now we call it data science. Okay, but to me, what 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 these ideas are is 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 this: you take the best hardware configurations you you can you can buy, and you use the most modern uh, programming systems, or in some cases, programming new, new programming languages developed. And you take the, the best algorithms you can invent, and you use it, all of these things, to, to solve problems that are of interest to people, uh, very often in the sciences, uh, but, but also in, in, uh, in, in the world of commerce. Um, OK, so you've probably seen this quote. I mean, uh, OK, data science, obviously, is, is very, very important. And I, by the way, the answer to the, my, the question in the title is, yes, I do think it's real, that, that there, is, there is something important going on there that everybody needs to know about. Uh, what happens, of course, when you are uh, when you're successful, everybody claims you for their own. Uh, and. Uh, um, uh, you know, as I said, the, the, I, I've, I've met people who, uh, who equate the term data science with the term machine learning, uh, and um, you know, they're, 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 certainly machine learning is a, is a part of it. I don't want to deny that. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that point. Uh, and then if you're in statistics, you tend to believe, I've heard, this, you, know, uh, you know, data science is statistics done right. Okay. Uh, may be true. Uh, well, my, again, in my world, I come from the database uh, world, uh, at least I, I have been for the last couple of decades. And um, to me, data science is just the evolution, you know, keeping up to date, given the advances in, in underlying technology, uh, with what database people have always been doing. OK. Uh, and since I want to talk a little bit about education, I understand this is actually a, a fairly interesting uh, issue uh, right here, right now. Um, I claim that the way to prepare data science, people to function in the data science world is to start them off with the basic computer science education and then tailor it. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, about that a little bit. OK, so here's my, I don't know how many have seen this. This, this turn, it, it turns out, uh, first of all, where, where did I get this diagram? I, I've seen statisticians love to show this slide. Why? Because it, it puts statistics sort of in the heart of, 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 uh, of, of data science. Um, who's Drew Conway? I thought it was John Conway for a while, but, uh, but it's not. Uh, Drew Conway is actually was, or when he, when he created this, um, uh, this Venn diagram, and, and by the way, where, where I, I got it from Wikipedia. There's actually an article on Wikipedia entitled "Data Science Venn Diagrams." This is this is the first this is the first one. This I think was the original attempt to do a a, a Venn diagram for data science. Uh, but there are many, many of them 
more ridiculous than this one, by the way. Uh, anyway, so, so who was Drew Connolly? It turns out he was a graduate student in political science at NYU when he, when he, uh, when he did this. Now, it drives me nuts okay, when, when, when someone advances this as a true picture. Well, okay, what bothers me? Well, this is a small matter. Okay, I, I've never heard the term substantive expertise before. Uh, but uh, if it, uh, to me, this, the domain knowledge is the right term. That is, you have to be an expert in biology or medicine or, or <coughs> sociology or something. Uh, now, what else? Let's see, what else bothers me? Well, th this drives me nuts. Okay. Um, hack, hacker is a term that if you are a computer scientist, you can refer to yourself as a hacker. But if you're not a computer scientist, it's an insult. Okay, it, it's one of, the, one of the, the few words you can only use if you are one, I, I think. So, okay, so it's, it's, it's computer science. It's not just about writing the code, although obviously that's important. But it's about all the things that computer scientists do that re really contribute to solving problems in domain science. Uh, so what else don't I like? Okay, characterize, basically what, what he was trying to say was that if, you, if, if you're a hacker uh, who is trying to attack a problem and you don't know math and you don't know statistics, uh, you're doomed. Okay, or you're going to doom your clients. Uh, okay, I don't uh, really believe that that's true and that in fact most data science can really be characterized in, in, in this way. Another thing, okay, traditional research, that's application of mathematics or statistics to some, uh, to some application area. Now, what, what happens when you don't actually hack, when you don't write any code? Basically, it's some mathematician amusing themselves, thinking about somebody else's problem, but not actually solving anything. Okay. So, uh, machine learning. Okay, that's an odd place to put it. Um, right? It, it says that machine learning doesn't actually touch applications. Uh, I don't know how many people here are, are machine learning uh, uh, in the field, but I'm sure you disagree with that if, 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 if you are. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I said uh, I'm part of this, this, um, uh, this Data Science Education Roundtable. Um, this is an organ. It, it, it was um, set up by the National Research Council, which, which is the administrative arm of the U.S. National Academies, which is the, that's the equivalent, I guess, of, I guess the Royal Society of, of Canada. Um, but uh, by the, st the statistics division of of the of, of the NRC. Uh, well, it contains statisticians and computer scientists and, and a number of others, people from mathematics and engineering backgrounds as well. Uh, uh, one of the odd things is usually when the NRC gets involved in something, uh, there's a report that has to come out of it and has to be validated. We are told not to write a report, so we just have to basically yell at each other, I think. Uh, but we're supposed to study, and, and there will probably be some I mean, one of the things we've been talking about, of course, is how do we let people know how we feel? Well, there is a website for the group that, that has minutes of our, our discussions. Uh, but eventually, we will try to uh, make some useful uh, comments. We are not supposed to, do, we're not a curriculum committee. We're not supposed to be de uh, designing the courses themselves. And, and, and I don't think anybody really wants to do that. OK, um, well. As time goes on, I guess uh, I've, I've made myself more and more obnoxious uh, in, in, this, in this group uh, by, by saying that basically, I think, you know, hey, back off statisticians, okay? It's computer science, okay? We need statistics. I mean, and, and there's no question that statistics is a very important background training for computer scientists. I, I do, do not deny this. Um, um, okay, and, and in fact, not only statistics, but, but all sorts of mathematics. Um, 
I do not think, though, that data science is a subject that lives outside of computer science. And, and that setting up a department of data science or something like that, or, uh, there, there are a number of universities where they've set up things. They don't often call it data science. They call it you know, school of information or something like that. And, and that's um, not a good idea, my, again, my personal opinion. Um, so you know, what I think should be done, and, and, and what we have, in fact, done at Stanford is uh, there are tracks at both the bachelor's and the master's level. I'm not going to even try to address PhD studies, because that's pretty much you do. You, know, you, you study whatever you want. If you want to do a thesis in data science, you just, you just do it. But in terms of, of a curriculum, uh, at, the, at the bachelor's level and master's level, there should be a track of computer science that prepares you to be, uh, to function as a data science. And so what, what, I, would, what I would put in there, um, First of all, what I now regard as, as the core for all of computer science, every computer scientist needs to know is you need you know, a, a couple of terms of calculus, uh, obviously linear algebra, uh, everybody takes discrete math, so there's a lot of math in there, and of course statistics. We were at Stanford and we require every bachelor's student in computer science to take uh, a, a real statistics course. Um, uh, and then obviously there are core uh, computer science subjects, I would say, uh, programming. You know, you, you can't be a data scientist if you aren't really comfortable programming. Uh, data structures, uh, typically the second programming course, and, and certainly some a course in, in, in software systems, so you sort of kind of know what an operating system is in a, 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 a compiler. Uh, okay, and, and then there are courses in computer science that are I believe every data scientist should know about. I, I feel a, a, a database uh, course, an AI course. Uh, these days, introduction, everybody's got an introduction to machine learning course, very popular at Stanford. Um, the number of people taking our introduction to um, machine learning is much, much larger than all the, com the uh, computer science students uh, put, at all levels put, to, put together. Uh, uh, I think a course in, in, in data mining, uh, I, I believe you should take a course in algorithms that goes beyond you know, the simple data structures, trees and graphs and, and hash tables and so on. Um, and then um, data wrangling. I mean, there are people who say, probably quite truthfully, that 80% that of the effort in a, in, a, in a data science project is getting your data into the shape you need it. It's called data wrangling. Um, to me, this is, it's, it, while it's essential, it's not the kind of thing you can really teach in a classroom. So I think that it's, uh, uh, it sort of belongs in what you might call a capstone course. That is, everybody needs to take a project in which they're given data that should be what they need but isn't, and they need to just you know, figure out you know, where is the data wrong, what other data do you need to, to supplement it, and so on, and just, just put it into the shape that you need. Uh, and then once you go beyond that, you know, depending on whether we're talking about a bachelor's degree and a, or, or a master's degree, you might uh, take um, uh, you know, I think there are some courses that you, you might take. Natural language processing seems to be becoming more and more important in data science these days. Uh, and then a, a lot of it has to do with parallel processing. There's been, of course, big advances both on the hardware and the software levels uh, for exploiting, uh, exploiting parallelism. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I never would have imagined that, that it was possible to do what, what we're, we're, we're now doing. Um, and then uh, you know, uh, second and third level courses in things like machine learning. I mean, now machine learning has, I, I, I want to use the word metastatized, but I don't know how to pronounce it, so I, I won't. Uh, uh, but, but I mean, it's be, uh, there are a, a great number of, of sort of specializations uh, within machine learning now. Same with AI, obviously, becoming uh, a much bigger component of things, and, and statistics. You could learn. Uh, 
you know, some people will probably need to know a lot more about statistics. Uh, and then, of course, it would be good to add a my, especially at the master's level. It's kind of maybe hard to fit this all in at the bachelor's level, but uh, uh, you, you ought to at least have experience with some kind of an application. Uh, uh, projects in which you've got somebody who knows how to compute and somebody who knows what to compute about, and they're supposed to talk to each other and they don't really understand what, uh, what the other is saying is, is probably not a and it's not an adequate arrangement. So, so I would say trying to, to give everybody some experience in some application area is a good idea. OK, so, so as I said, I'm on, on this, uh, the, you know, this, this um, uh, education roundtable, and, and I listen to this, the, the, the statisticians, and he, what, what drives me nuts is they are all in favor of, they like to analyze the data, but they don't like to solve the problems that the data is there to solve. Um, so, so, for example, this is actually just, just uh, two weeks ago, at our latest meeting, we had um, a, a discussion of a, a, a program that's apparently fairly widespread. Um, it's it's, it's uh, all over the US and, and, and Canada as well. Uh, where the statisticians have their version of a hackathon, where, where teams are invited, they, they stay up for 48 hours, and they're given a large data set, and they're told to find something interesting. And you win by finding the most interesting thing. It's, 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 it's judged, uh, you know, I guess. It, it, so you have to find what, what turns out to interest the judges. Uh, okay. Uh, it's exciting, you know, I'm sure lots of people have lots of fun doing this. They got t-shirts and everything, you know. Uh, um, the trouble is, you know, there's a computer science way of doing this, and I think it's a better way, which is you give them the, you give them the data, and you ask them to actually solve a problem with the data. And, you know, Kaggle competitions are, are, I think, a good example of this phenomenon. Um, another... Um, an, another talk we had a, a, two weeks ago um, was a, there's a company that sort of sells boot camps to turn uh, you know people who are out there in the in industry turn them into data scientists really quickly and uh, one of the things that that struck me was that they had a, a good outline of the um, the data science pipeline uh, you know starts with um, you know, you find your data, you clean the data, and so on. But there, the end result of this pipeline was a model. Okay. Now I want to. I'm going to get into this uh, much, um, much more seriously in, 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 a, in a minute. Um, it is true that in ma many problems, you solve it by creating a model. And then the algorithm is really simple. You just apply the model to your input, and the model tells you what to do. Uh, for example, finding spam email. Okay, once you've figured out what's, you know, how to tell whether an email is a spam, the algorithm is, 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 is simple. So it really is, that's really a model uh, constructing thing. But um, again, I'm going to talk about cases where the problem is not solved by creating a model. And it frustrates me that statisticians don't think that the algorithm is the thing. Okay. Uh, okay. So he, I'm going to just order. Uh, he, why should I be the only one who doesn't have a Venn diagram? Uh, so he, I, okay, there's computer science and there's domain science, and the intersection is data science. <laughs> now, where does machine learning fit in? Well, machine learning is a branch of computer science, not quite as big as that bubble might suggest. And uh, a lot of data science is, uh, is done through machine learning, probably more than I've even uh, suggested here. But again, you, you have to forgive me. I only know how to draw circles in PowerPoint. And, um, and, and so I have to position things so you can actually read the, the, the words. As, as, uh, and now where do math and stat come in? 
Okay, again, they're, they're much bigger, uh, obviously, than, than, uh, than I show here, but, but when you have five bubbles on a Venn diagram and you only know how to draw circles, uh, you're kind of limited. Uh, but the, uh, the idea is math and, st uh, and statistics both are, in, they inform computer science in many ways, including through machine learning, but they don't deliver data science directly. Okay, they do it through the algorithms that come out of, mach uh, out of well, machine learning or computer science more generally. Okay, so anyway, that's my, uh, my, my diagram. Okay, so let me sort of summarize what, what Okay, what's my problem with, uh, with, with statistics? Okay, I, I have to start off by uh, you know, conceding that there, again, there are very important aspects of computer science that really, where you really need statistics on, uh, at a, a, a sophisticated level, uh, such as this, you know, randomized algorithms, very big these days. Um, and often analysis of algorithms depends upon really the, your notion of what's random data and, and, and being able to then analyze uh, the algorithm on, uh, on random data. I, I want to say also that there are certain applications, certain aspects of data science where you can't get away with sloppy statistics. Okay, uh, and, and an example is if, you, if you're analyzing census data and you come up with something that says 10% uh, of the population in Waterloo is below the, po uh, the poverty level. Well, that's a political statement, and it better be right. Okay, you, you'd, you'd better have a good formal justification for why you made that statement. But um, I think there are many more cases where you don't, you, you have neither the need nor the ability to do that statistical analysis. And um, uh, you know, what, what I claim is there are many, many examples where it's more important to do the best you can, and often you just find out how well you're doing experimentally, um, uh, uh, then it's more important to just, just be able to get out there and do something than to know how well you're doing. Okay. Um, and I just want to, you know, remark that, that many of the modern statisticians are actually functioning as computer scientists. I'm not going to go into it, but we're going to, I'm going to talk later about locality-sensitive hashing. And I was surprised a couple of months ago I discovered that a colleague of mine from statistics, Art Owen, um, had written a paper a couple of years ago on, uh, on an aspect of locality-sensitive hashing and had discovered something absolutely marvelous. So something I should have realized, but didn't. Okay. But what was important in that paper to me was the algorithm, not the statistical analysis of it. Um, uh, okay, but so let's talk about an example where, where, it, where, where doing the best you can is, is really the thing. Uh, so, if, for, for example, uh, Google uh, detects phishing. Uh, uh, emails, right? and um, it's pretty good. So how good is it? I have no idea, and I don't think that the people at Google do. And since these attacks evolve and um, uh, they evolve over time, even if they had a perfectly good analysis of of how well they're doing or how likely they are to 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 uh, to discover a, 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 phishing, a, a phishing email. It, it, today, it wouldn't apply tomorrow. You, you, they're just going to do the best they can. OK. And you know, again, coming back to the Conway diagram, if you, if you think that this is a danger zone, well, you can probably read it as well as I can, that the real danger is not being willing to do this and letting somebody lose their life savings because they have fall victim to a phishing attack, um, and, and you know not deploying a system because you haven't uh, you haven't done the analysis. Okay, well, I, I, you know, I, I, there are lots of examples. 
you, you, can, you can see, see some of them here. Uh, people are beginning to learn how to relate your genome to the proper treatment. Okay. Uh, well, it's just in its infancy, but you might as well try something. If, you know, if, if the data suggests that you might respond better to drug A than drug B, try drug A first. Okay, uh, you know, and, and if you don't know, you know, how valid that conclusion is, doesn't matter. You got to, you, you know, you got to do something. Uh, hurricanes, I don't know, I guess, I guess Canada's kind of a, you don't get hurricanes around here, but uh, we've been hit with a lot of them in the United States recently. Um, uh, well, the Ireland got a hurricane a couple of days ago. Uh, it, you know, we're getting pretty good at predicting these things. We're not perfect by any means. Okay, but you know, it, it's better to have a rough idea of what things, what's going on, than to to worry about the fact that you can't get it exactly right and you don't even know, the, let's say, the probability that a hurricane is going to hit the west coast of Florida rather than the east coast. Um, you know, or, or even you know, in, in the commercial world, I mean, not quite as important to, to, to many people, but, but um, you know, even taking a shot at predicting what, you know, what ad is it worth showing me, why not? You know, if you, you do the best you can. Okay, now I want to go after machine learning. Okay. Um, well, again, I, I don't want to be too negative. The fact is that there are um, uh, lots of you know lots of applications of data science where what you really want is a model, and moreover, machine learning techniques are much better, or somewhat better, uh, than other techniques in in building that model. Um, but you know, there's a, there are a couple of reasons why I do not think that machine learning deserves to be considered all of all of data science. Uh, one thing is um, that I've, I've noticed that there are people in the machine learning community who will claim that everything is machine learning. I've even had a guy stare me, you know, face to face, say locality sensitive hashing is machine learning because it's a really good idea. <laughs> That's not, I mean, there's no model involved. It's, it's not learning anything. And we're going to talk about locality sensitive hashing if you, if you haven't seen it. Um, uh, anyway, there are a num number of ideas that, that predate machine learning or a uh, case of association rules we'll talk about in, in a minute. Uh, really came from the database community. Uh, again, then uh, the second is, is if you think that a model is all you need, that's, that just isn't true. And again, I'll, I'll try to give you some examples. Um, and then the third is that understandability is in some cases a real issue. And machine learn the best machine learning models often are totally incomprehensible. So, um, well, anyway, I want to talk about association rules for a minute. Um, again, without going into too much detail, if you've never seen these, um, the, 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 they apply in a situation where the data comes in baskets, and each basket is a set of items. And uh, what you want to the, the, the rules that you develop have to do with when certain items are in a lot of baskets, you can expect to find other items. Okay, and as I said, this came out of the database community, bef well, before machine learning was a big thing. It was a thing, but not a, not a big thing. Uh, so just, just as an example, if, if, if you think of an email as a basket of words, um, you might discover a rule like, if an email contains the words Nigerian and Prince, then I will conclude that it is a phishing uh, email. Okay. Um, now, the fact is that even the dumbest machine learning models outperform the uh, association rule. 
uh, an analysis. Uh, you know, if, uh, what I think is sort of the, the, the simplest thing is you learn weights, positive or negative, on each word. And you take the email, you sum all the weights of the words in the email, and you see if it's greater than zero. If it is, you say it's, it's a phishing email. Otherwise, you say it's not. Um, but the, OK, so the, the problem with association rules is that if you actually are a Nigerian prince, and there are some people who are Nigerian princes, there's no question. I mean, in fact, there was this Onion article a couple of days ago that said, man in Nigeria dies with $27 billion. And it's, he said, he tried to give the money away, but nobody would answer his emails. Uh, um, OK, but the, the, but the point is, it's association rules are understandable. Right? If you're a Nigerian prince and they show you, well, here are the rules we're following, you say, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't say I'm a Nigerian prince if I want somebody to read my email. Um, now, I don't know how many have done this, but I, occasionally I will ask um, Google why they declared a certain e email in my inbox to be spam. And it says something like this. Basically, you know, basically it says, um, you know, well, there, we have some model. We can't explain to you what the model is because we probably don't know what it is. Uh, and uh, the model says it's spam. Okay, and and again, they're pretty good at it. No, no question. You know, they get it right almost all the time. Uh, now, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, if you know. Um, I mean, really, you, you, you want some good emails to wind up in your spam box because that, you know, the fact that that can happen enables you to ignore emails you just don't want to deal with. And, and you can always say it wound up in spam later. Uh, OK. Um, uh, more, more rel you know, insurance companies build a model of, let's say, what a good driver is. And they may come up with some very mysterious model using deep learning or something, I don't know. And, and all of a sudden, your insurance premium goes up because the model says you're not as good a driver as you thought you were. Uh, that's a real, you know, that, that, that's a serious problem. Uh, and very shortly, I guess starting in, in the next year, uh, the European Union has passed, you know, you know these Brussels regulations that, that say, um, you can't use a model you can't explain. Okay, well, Ian, I, I don't want to get into how stupid I think this is, but uh, so uh, okay. So so here's here's what I think. Um, when you should use uh, machine learning and when you shouldn't. Um, okay, first of all, if if, if the problem doesn't yield to a model then machine learning is not useful. If it does, it might. It's a good candidate. Uh, you also need to make sure that, that you'll, you will never need to explain to somebody what the model is doing. Uh, and a third point is that it, the problem has to be something where people don't really understand it. Uh, and um, the thing, the thing that if 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 humans can understand the problem, there's no reason to try machine learning, and it probably won't work as well as a well-engineered system. The um, canonical example um, we had, uh, back, I guess the, the the late 1990s, a couple of our students at. at at Stanford started a company called Zhong Li, uh, which was a, it was a database company. Uh, an interesting story, which I won't go into, but um, they, they did very well. Uh, one of their founders later started a company called Whizbang Labs using some of his loot from the, uh, the sale of Zhong Li. Uh, and they, they, they hired some of the top machine learning people of that, of that era. Uh, and, uh, but the target that they picked was identifying people's resumes on the web. 
Okay. Um, and uh, they, they tried as hard as they could using machine learning techniques to identify that. The, the business model, of course, was then uh, they were going to, to be a, a service. If you were a company wanted to hire people, they could say, OK, here are links to uh, you know, 1,000 resumes of people that meet your needs. Um, the trouble is they, they couldn't do as well as, as, as existing techniques, that were sort of handwritten techniques for finding uh, resumes on the web. The reason is we all understand what a resume looks like. Okay, it's got pre, you know, words like previous employment or salary or uh, education, uh, things that appear in very few documents on the web that aren't resumes. Uh, so as I said, so they unfortunately went bankrupt. Uh, trying to to beat obvious techniques for well understood problem a well understood problem uh, with machine learning. Okay, so as I said, now, now we'll just come to the technical part of the uh, of the talk. A couple of minutes left. Um, and I want to tell you about two algorithms. Uh, uh, one is uh, locality sensitive hashing, the other is uh, approximate counting that I think are very important for data scientists to know about and that have nothing at all to do with, uh, uh, with, with, um, uh, with model building. Uh, I thought I, I would just, if, if you haven't seen this, we have this free book, uh, there's the link to it. Uh, uh, on data mining. It does, actually does talk about machine learning uh, techniques, but just a little bit. It's, it's, it's got a lot more than that. Uh, and I also have a MOOC now running at Stanford. I, I don't expect you to memorize this, but I'm sure if you just Google uh, Stanford MOOC uh, Ullman or something, it'll, uh, it'll get you that. OK, so uh, okay, locality sensitive hashing. How, how many have seen, how many know what this is all about? A few, a few OK. Uh, all right, sorry about this. But anyway, just a couple of slides. Um, OK, so, so the goal is we want to uh, compare, we need to, com do, uh, we need to compare every pair of items in some large set for some reason, say simil finding similarity uh, of them. And the trouble is, because you're comparing all pairs, you've got this quadratic problem. So um, uh, let's, um, you know, let's talk about en entity resolution is, is a good uh, example. You're given a set of records. Some of those records refer to the same people. You want to find out which pairs uh, re refer to the same, the same people. Um, and if I take one million records, that's hardly a big data set these days. Uh, but you've got half a trillion comparisons to make. Now that already is going to require a big parallel machine uh, or cluster. Uh, if, if you have any hope of, of comparing half a do, doing half a trillion of anything uh, is, is, is still a, a bit um, difficult. And uh, by the way, the, the, the comparison is a little bit tricky. It's not just looking for identical values in corresponding fields. You have to uh, recognize the fact that p uh, people, uh, you know, names get misspelled. Uh, I might give my uh, cell phone in one record and my, my landline in, in another record. So, so even though they refer to the same peep, the same person, uh, the phones are completely different. So, so there are lots of, lots of problems. Uh, now, I claim that there's, the, the, the problem is not a problem of modeling. You might say, well, you know, but the, the, the model is what makes two records similar. Okay. Uh, well, maybe, but that's not the part of the problem that's important. Uh, moreover, if you're thinking in machine learning terms, how do you train that model? Where do, you get, where do you get the training set from? If you send random pairs of records to Mechanical Turk, uh, you, um, 
the answer is always going to be no, they're not the same person, or should be, because it's very, you know, this, this is the whole problem, is finding this, the needles in the haystack, the pairs that actually are the same person. Uh, so so it's, it's, machine learning doesn't solve this. Now it turns out, obviously, there's an obvious n squared algorithm if n is the number of records. Um, but if you're willing to accept a, a few false negatives, that is, just miss a few pairs, uh, then you can do a lot better than that. Uh, and this, this is, the, by the way, the general idea behind locality sensitive hashing is you use a large number of hash functions. Each hash function throws all the items that you're, you're working with into buckets. Okay, different set of buckets for each hash function, of course. Uh, and what you want is that, well, the chances are better that two items will wind up in the same bucket if they, at least one of these hash functions, uh, if they're similar than if they're not similar. Okay, and you might think, you know, how can, how can you do that? That sort of requires some sort of clairvoyance on the part of the, of the hash function, uh, but, it, but it doesn't. Uh, and if, if you design your hash functions right, then um, uh, it, you just look at the pairs of items that it, for at least one of these hash functions wound up in the same bucket. And then you still have to test them because uh, it could be a coincidence. But you should be able to then at least focus on a lot less than the full uh, n squared pairs. Um, Okay, so for example, in, in the, the, the entity resolution situation, we might say, well, all the records are going to have a name. So let's hash, uh, uh, hash the buck, hash, one hash function will be the, uh, the exact value of the name. So if, if two records have the same name, then we're going to at least inspect them and decide whether they represent the same person. Again, obviously they might not. There are people who are completely different and yet have the same name. Uh, we might also hash by phone number. Again, if two people have the same phone number, there's a, well, two records have the same phone number, there's a good chance that they're referring to the same person. It's not 100% chance, but we ought to at least be looking at that. And then, you know, you can find more, just depending on what fields your, uh, your records have, you, 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 uh, you try to hash them uh, on uh, on different uh, records. And so what I want, what I need to hope is that if two records represent the same person, they'll agree in at least one field. Okay, and moreover, if the records represent different people, they won't be exactly the same in, in any, any one field. And that's probably a good, um, a, a good assumption. Okay. And as, as I said, you still, um, it's not sufficient to just say everybody in the same bucket is the same person. You still have to look at them and apply some, uh, you know, some measure of how similar those records really are. They should be similar in not just one field, but at least a few fields. Uh, and again, how you do that, that, that really depends. That's a very data dependent issue, and I don't, I don't want to go into that. Uh, okay, so the, the, the second thing I want to I tell you about is the problem of approximate counting. Uh, and uh, one example of where, the, where this would be important, let's say Facebook uh, wants to report how many unique users visited uh, Facebook each month. Okay, so what you have is you have a stream of logins and um, uh, you want to, you know, you look at a whole month's worth of, of logins for Facebook and you want to figure out how many different, uh, uh, different login names uh, are there. Uh, well, it's, it's an easy problem to solve. You just keep a record of every name you've seen and when a new name comes in, you look it up to see if... Um, uh, if, if, it, if it exists. And by the way, I say people taking pictures of the slides. I'm going to leave the slides. You're going to have the slides. Not a problem. Okay. Uh, 
But uh, okay, so you can keep like a hash table. You can very efficiently tell whether a new login is in fact an old login because it appeared before. If not, you throw it into your hash table, uh, and that works. And these days, with you know, machines are so big, Facebook could probably do that on a single uh, single compute node. Uh, but it, it does use a lot of space, right? Yeah, they're about two, they're probably, the answer will probably be around 2 billion users uh, logged in in this month. And um, you know, each one has a login name, I don't know, it's 10, 20 characters long. You know, so we're, we're, talking, we're talking about many, uh, m many gigabytes of, of space. Uh, again, not insurmountable by any means. Uh, but here, here's an, uh, I want to just give you an example of a problem where the, the, the hash table, relatively small, but the number of hash tables is astronomical, so you don't really have the space to do this conveniently. Uh, and the example is web crawling. Now, the fact is the web is too big for even Google to record it all. So you visit page, you know, you have these crawlers going out there, they're visiting pages, and each page gives you links to some other pages. And you want to decide which pages should I bother crawling. Okay. Well, what you really want is to follow the links from the high page rank pages. Because those are the pages that will lead you to other pages that will have high page rank or might have high page rank. And therefore might become the answer to somebody's search query. Uh, if everything is, you know, if it's all down in the noise there, nobody's going to want to see it anyway, so, so there's no point in crawling it. Uh, trouble is, of course, you can't compute the page rank while you're crawling. Uh, so uh, what people do is they just count the number of inlinks to a page. And they prefer to visit the pages that have, have been reached an, a, a large number of times. Um, so what you want to do for each, for each page you're visiting, and there could be a trillion pages, okay, uh, you want to count the number of inlinks, the number of different inlinks that you've seen. Okay. Uh, now, the technique I want to talk about gives you, is it called approximate counting. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't give you the exact count, but it, you know, the more work you do, the, 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 the better, the, uh, uh, the, the closer the, the count is likely to be. Uh, and since this is all just an approximation anyway, uh, you know, uh, an approximate count is, is probably fine. So there's an algorithm called Flagellet-Martin. Uh, let me see. Uh, maybe I, this is a little tricky. Um, you know, as I said, the idea is you can count for one, one page at least, you, you can count the number of distinct inlinks um, using much less space than just listing all of those inlinks. Uh, so you're going to create variables, um, let's say 100 for each page. And a, a, a variable, in this case, is a, is a small integer. I mean, really small. Um, one byte is enough, probably four bits. Uh, as you'll, you'll see, is probably enough to identify the pages that you want to crawl anyway. Um, so, so you know, you may have a hundred variables, but they're, it's really just a couple of couple of machine words. Um, so, for each variable v, let's talk about, I'm just going to talk about one variable. You do this again, maybe a hundred a hundred different variables. You design a hash function. It's got to be a different hash function for each variable. Hash function takes inputs, say uh, user logins or something. Uh, it's going to hash to a bit string. And the, t uh, the tail length of a bit string is the number of zeros at the end. Okay, so half the bit strings have a tail length of zero, quarter of them have a tail length of one, and so on. Now, my variable is simply going to record for its hash function the longest tail that it's seen for any input. Okay, now, if after seeing all, you know, all the inputs or all the inputs up to some point, uh, 
the a variable v has a tail length of r, then v is going to guess that there are two to the r different inputs. And if you think about it, that, that's sort of right, because if you have two to the r inputs, the chances are pretty good that one of them will have all zeros. It's, it's actually 1 minus 1 over e is the actual probability. Um, about 60, 63%, something like that. Um, uh, on the other hand, if, you, if you've seen a lot more than 2 to the r inputs, chances become really high that you will see at least r zeros at the end of, of some random uh, bit string. And if you've seen much fewer than 2 to the r, the chances are kind of small that you'll see as many as r uh, zeros. Okay, well, I won't go into it, but you have to combine the estimates from all these variables using um, an average of, of medians kind of, uh, of an approach. Uh, but the more variables you have, the better accuracy you get, the closer you, you, are, you can expect to get to the actual count. Okay, so with that, I will conclude. Oh, it's just, just on time. Okay, so again, uh, the messages I want to leave you with. Okay, first of all, data science uh, is the natural evolution of the work that's been going on in computer science for, for decades. Um, uh, again, the statistics view is, is not wrong, but it's not right either, uh, again, because it puts too much emphasis on analysis, not enough on solutions. And uh, machine learning, again, while it is certainly a major part of what goes on in data science, uh, is not uh, everything. You do need to know a lot of things that are not machine learning. Okay. And with that, I will, I guess, take questions. Okay, uh, would, we have uh, time to, for questions. Uh, who would care to toss the first stone? Yeah. Ah. I'll pass in the microphone. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you gave some examples of why, it, why it's okay to just do the best you can and you don't care or maybe you can't figure out mm -hmm. how well you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. But that's exceedingly dangerous for important problems. Like you gave an example about choosing a medicine. Choosing the medicine without knowing what the accuracy is of uh, A over B, uh, assuming that A has more side effects than B, for example, uh, would make it uh, very, potentially very dangerous. Other things like uh, deciding who gets bank loans. Uh, if, you, if you don't worry about the accuracy of your algorithm, even if it's doing fairly well, you start believing it too much. You put too much faith into it if you don't know. And, uh, and uh, in this political atmosphere that we have uh, going on around the world, uh, more and more I'm going to see politicians believing these uh, outputs and uh, making decisions that are very bad for society based on those decisions. Yeah. Uh, well, those machine learning yeah, yeah, or, or, yeah. or other data science okay. I, uh, I think, I think uh, Frank, I think you, I think you, you, you raised two uh, different I issues. Uh, one is uh, choosing a medicine might be more complicated than just the uh, likelihood of success. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think, I mean, even before we had, you know, genome-based medicine, I mean, just, you know, something, you know, an operation may have a better chance of curing you than taking a pill, but do you really want to be, you know, in the hospital for two months? I mean, those, those are perfectly uh, legitimate issues, but I don't think that they, um, I, I, I don't think that we're going to, that is, I, I don't think we're going to resolve that by any sort of analysis of how your genome, uh, uh, you know, affects your, your, uh, your, your acceptability for some some medication. I mean that uh, that's that's all that can be answered. The, the the analysis can't tell you what the side effect probably can't tell you what the side effects are. Although I guess I, I guess that in, at least in some cases should should be possible as well. 
But um, uh, now, now the other the other example of the question of bank loans that that becomes a political decision. So I put that in the same class of the class as um, as, as con drawing conclusions from census data. Okay, that, that that is the kind of thing where if you are going to deny someone a bank loan, you'd better prepare to be audited because somebody's uh, again I don't know what the process whether the process is that there's some oversight government oversight for the bank or so someone's going to sue the bank for discriminating against um, you know people who fall into this class of the um, uh, you know whatever the model is doing okay so so that I, I would I would certainly I would certainly put matters of bank loans or insurance premiums as political decisions that the, the way where in fact the statistics is and, and your ability to justify what you're doing is necessary, although actually probably not even sufficient, just, just because politics work that way. Uh. More questions? Shai has one question. We have to realize that even when machine learning does give us guarantees, these are statistical guarantees. Yeah. So if you have applications in which is it critical not to make a mistake, then you cannot rely on these guarantees anyway. So we really have to uh, distinguish between different types of applications. If it's spam filtering, I don't mind that there is some small probability mm -hmm. of mistake. If it's uh, you know, life uh, critical issues, then I, will, I have to be aware of it. So I don't think we have an overall solution we have to be aware that machine learning only gives us statistical guarantees and they don't give us full uh, you know, performance uh, safety. And no. it really depends on the yeah. application, oh, whether oh, you oh, want oh, to rely on this or not. Oh, I agree. I, I think none of, none of, no, nothing gives you 100% guarantees, right? I mean, you can use all the statistics, all the mathematics you want. You have things no, like the Tacoma Narrows bridge falling down, even though all the mathematics said that it wouldn't, and and proved that it wouldn't. No, yeah. but as you said, the default is going back to the expert, like you were saying, in, in areas in which we have good expertise. The default is going back to the doctor. I trust him more than the machine learning program when it becomes a critical decision, or I go back to the pilot when it is a critical. Right. The the default is going back to the domain expert when you need. Sure, we cannot guarantee even that, but we trust it more on, on critical uh, decisions. Um, yeah. You know, a, 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 good, no, no, a, a good example for your issue is driverless cars. Okay. We're never going to prove that a driverless car will never kill someone. And in fact, they will kill people. Okay. But drivered cars also kill people and will probably kill a lot more people. Okay, so if, if your standard is absolute guarantee, nothing will go wrong, we're not going to do anything, right? Okay. Um, but if you're claiming that we get better than what we have, then we may be able to do that. Right, but, but, but again, in the driverless car situation, it's going to be, there are going to be driverless cars out on the road, experimentally, and we're going to discover that their accident rate is smaller. Okay. Uh, you know, and the important thing will be the data. It'll, it'll show that, I, I hope, will show that your chances are less of having an accident if you ride in a driverless, if you let the, if you let the car take over for you than if, if you drive yourself. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of guarantees, uh, you know, will, uh, you know, even if, if you analyze, you know, can analyze the data, you can say, well, if everything is the same in the future as it is in the, uh, as it is now, then the probability of an accident with a driverless car is X and here's the standard deviation, and here's two standard deviations, and so on. You can get the exact statistics, but things won't be the same. I mean, people are already figuring out 
things like, I can cross the street in front of a driverless car because it'll stop for me no matter what. <laughs> you know, so people will start behaving differently. And it's the same as the spam email problem. Spammers recognize, I mean, spammers will do things like, um, you know, they, they, they will see which emails don't wind up in their, in their spam folder, and then they'll duplicate those to, to other people. They, they're going to figure out empirically what Google is, find, is detecting as spam and what it isn't. Uh, you know, so pe people, people are going to learn to change the environment, the assumptions about driverless cars and probably pretty much everything. Right? I mean, for, even, even the, for all we know, even in the medical field, uh, uh, viruses will evolve to take advantage of, you know, to, to find the holes in the machine learning algorithm that determines uh, treatments. Who knows? Who know? You know. So I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on driverless cars. So one message you gave in the talk was don't use machine learning if you can't explain the decisions. But now you seem to say, for example, for driverless cars, they're going to be a lot safer. But it seems like we still, when they kill people, we still won't be able to explain other than yeah, well, the answer that Google gave you, for example, that is the model set, take a right, and that killed the, but you know, maybe yeah. we won't be able to explain well, why the model set, take what, a right. I mean, what I said was, don't use machine learning if you are going to be expected to explain. Okay. Now, in the case of driverless cars, I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right that they are, the, the algorithms are much too complicated. I don't care whether you do machine learning or not. They're going to be much too complicated to explain to anybody why, uh, you know, why this poor little puppy got run over and so on. Uh, you, in that, I mean, if if the laws shake out to require an explanation of why a driverless car did what it did, uh, then we're just not going to have them. And I think that would be sad. But, but, yeah, but yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying don't do anything you can't explain. Um, but I'm just saying, if you need to explain it, think about something besides machine learning to do. We've got a couple more questions. Yes. Question? So my question goes along the lines of this one. You mentioned that the EU decision of banning yeah. what you can't explain as yeah. stupid um, and I thought it just was a way to avoid discrimination against your consumers by sort of being able to explain how you ended up coming up with your decisions. So uh, I just wanted to know what, yeah, why. Yes, that. yes, that's, that's why it's stupid. Uh, basic, basically, you're, you're favoring, uh, uh, you, you, you're going to require peop, uh, companies to use inferior algorithms in order to explain, rather than, you know, for, for example, if I'm an insurance company, uh, uh, you know, rather than making me explain what I'm doing, let me figure out that there's this niche. All the other insurance companies are, they have models that don't, um, that discriminate against this group of people. So I'll build a model that takes advantage of that and favors them. Okay, and then they, you know, that is the normal commerce should iron out uh, problems of, of, of discrimination. Uh, and and I, th I think, you know, I, ju I just see this as a, a problem of a sort of rampant bureaucracy in Brussels as, 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 as the problem. But hey, that's just me. Hi, um, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I watched a video on YouTube, uh, one of your lectures on automating education. So I was wondering mm -hmm. what are your thoughts in uh, automating data science and why is a degree in computer science so expensive? Do you think it can be cheaper like through automation? Ooh, um, it's interesting, I'm wondering what you, what, what you saw on YouTube. but. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, I do. Uh, I mean, I do believe that um, uh, automating education is a good idea. Um, 
not as good an idea as I once thought it, it was. That is, I thought that MOOCs were going to solve everything, and they don't. Uh, there, there really is something to a, um, a, a, a classroom education for many, many people. I mean, there are people who can just pick up a MOOC or, or download the MOOC, and they learn the stuff. But these people are much rarer than we thought. On the other hand, uh, look, people have been using textbooks for m many, many years. Okay, when I go into class, I mean, I tend to use my own textbooks, but, um, but I, have, I have taught classes from other people's textbooks. I, I didn't find it a problem, you know, to, to use some, you know, the work that somebody else has done uh, to, to help me do my class. Why should I not also tell students, watch this MOOC? Instead of me lecturing, just watch the MOOC, and I'll help you out in some other way. And people talk now about flipped classrooms. As, as, uh, you, know, you have people watch the MOOC just as they would have in previous years uh, read the textbook, and then you, you discuss it with them, or you work a problem. You, see, you, you, um, you do a problem session with them. Uh, or you, uh, you hold office hours that are longer and you let people really come in and discuss the things that, that they're having trouble with and just do one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but the point is there is, there, there, there is a lot of opportunity, I think, to, to use MOOCs in classrooms. Um, and um, uh, and, and basi basically uh, make, make faculty more productive. Um, uh, why is it so expensive? Um, market, you know, market forces basically, you know, uh, schools charge what they can get away with. What, what can I tell you? Uh, you know, at Stan you know, Stanford, we charge a $50,000 tuition. Well, people are lining up to pay it. You know. <laughs> so, uh, what, you know. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Actually, uh, my question was pretty similar to the one you have uh, already answered. Uh, it was related to a note I am uh, seeing in the University of Waterloo website. It says, where Waterloo does not currently participate in a massive open online course offering, but open courseware is available for you to learn independently. So I wanted to know your opinion in terms of uh, this um, like explosive number of online courses that we are like, uh, I, I mean, that we are seeing currently. Um, what's your opinion in terms of uh, is it possible for someone to uh, learn to the same level just by taking online courses or just by a uh, self-learning strategy? Um, again, I think the, the answer is for a small number of people at Waterloo, yes. For most people, no. Okay, but that's not to say you shouldn't uh, watch the MOOC if it's relevant to your class. And, and what I think is appropriate is for the instructor to say, this is a MOOC you should watch. As part of your education, just as they might say, uh, this is our textbook, read the textbook during the course. One last question. Hi, thank you for your talk, Jeff. Um, I had a question about, we hear a lot about creating the algorithms, but I haven't heard much about what you do once the algorithms are out in the real world. How do you get data back to ensure that your algorithm is getting the best possible solutions and isn't, isn't discarding data that it shouldn't be discarding? And you know, how do you make it so uh, that the EU doesn't say that we can't be using models that we can't explore? That we well, can't they're going to do that anyway because the people who pass those laws or uh, the regulations don't, don't really think these things through. But uh, I mean, the, the answer to your question is, it really depends, okay? Uh, if, again, if you're Google, 
testing an algorithm for selecting which of 10 pages to show you, they measure it, right? They're always watching, do you click on one of the 10? And if so, is it the first one or the second one or the third one? They'll change their algorithm a little bit and see if the average position of the first click it goes up or down. If it goes up, they say this is a good algorithm, at least today. If it goes down, it says it's a bad algorithm, let's forget it. Real-time feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so some, sometimes sometimes it's, it's tricky. Again, certainly you can you can learn about changes to the algorithm, right? So the bank, if the bank changes the the algorithm, then after a while, it will discover that either the default rate's gone up or it's gone down. Um, and if it's gone up, then they get rid of that algorithm. If it's gone down, they keep the algorithm. But that's of course a little bit. It's a much slower cycle than um, uh, uh, than email than things like email spam, obviously. Um, uh, you know, but um, sometimes you can use historical data. So you might, you know, for and the trouble is, of course, it's only one side. They the bank only knows about the performance of the people that. Um, that they did give loans to. So they could say, if this were the algorithm in place, would we have detected more of the people who, uh, who, who actually did not repay their loan? Uh, so you can sometimes do that. What you can never do, uh, in, in that situation at least, is uh, figure out, if we had given this person a loan, would they have repaid it? Uh, there, there's, uh, there was actually a very, very interesting study that was done um, by a colleague of mine, Chris Ray. Um, they looked at should a judge give uh, a, uh, an accused person bail? And they had, again, this, this you know, th what they discovered was that even without using certain obvious pieces of information like a person's race, uh, that they could do better than the judges in the one-sided problem of giving bail. You know, if you say, I'm going to give a bail, bail to, say, 70% of the people, they were able to pick 70% that had a much smaller uh, recidivism rate, okay, that is, who actually committed a crime while they were out on bail. Uh, so they were doing a better job than, than, the, than the judges. Of course. But, but of course, what they could never do was to find out of those people that were incarcerated waiting trial, would they have committed a crime if they, uh, if, if they, if they left, if they had been uh, let out on bail. Um, um, so, you know, uh, okay, I mean, so the one, the, the one sidedness problem is, is a problem, but. In general, the answer to your question is you got to you you got to figure that out, you know. You, uh, but uh, you know, but let's put it. I don't think the answer is to do the statistical analysis and and predict what that probability is going to be, be because um, you know the world's going to change anyway. Even if you can do the analysis based on previous data, uh, you, you don't you don't know what's going to happen. Again, when the world adapts to the existence of the algorithm and so on, or, or just changes as, as the world does. All right. Uh, let's thank Jeff again. And